idea for all this really came from a dream? Yes, it did. audio things good evening and welcome to Knox mente tonight's guest is craig williams an ordained gnostic bishop and a highly empowered adept of esoteric voodoo craig williams has moved beyond i lost my place I'm sorry, has moved beyond conservative views of Vedic studies, evolving a radically unique system of esoteric Hinduism and left-hand Tantra. With over 25 years of academic and initiatic study in yoga, Ayurveda, Tantra, Yotish, and Vedanta, Williams is the recipient of the prestigious Veda COVID, Yoga Charya, and Yoga Yurveda Da Charya, titles awarded by the American Institute of Vedic Studies and the Academy of Traditional Ayurveda. Author of Cave of the Numinous, Tantric Volume, Physics Volume 1, and Entering the Desert, Pilgrimage to the Hinterland of the Soul, along with numerous articles on health, martial arts, and authentic initiation into the Kali Yuga, Williams is a vocal proponent for the benefits of serious spiritual practice in the contemporary world. Craig, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for that intro. You got all the uh, Sanskrit words correct. Did I really? <laughs> yeah, good job. It can be difficult. I am shocked. And also, not to um, not to forget Cult of Golgotha. Amazing. Yeah, it's an, that must have been older bios. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. My new book, Cult of Golgotha. Yeah, I I actually just wanted to start in with that, and oh, yeah. I so <laughs> you know the show's not so much about the work people do as it is about them, and so we'll get there. I just wanted to. Uh, I read a lot of books. I'm I'm definitely a reader of a lot of books. And I I came in. My story is a little bit similar to yours, but not w minus the spiritualism and all that. Uh, but I've come in as a person that puts practice in. You know, I, I do work. I do work. And I do work on myself. I've always been called to do it. And this book. So I, I ordered these. I ordered everything that an anthem had. And right. so I got year two. And I immediately was drawn to Cult of Golgotha, the hardbound, because it's so gorgeous. Oh, thank you. And, I mean, it's just physically beautiful. And as a, a person that's real sensual about stuff with the, my Taurus son, now this Venusian energy I have, I just yeah. couldn't help myself. It's, it's silk. It's got gold stamping. The paper's beautiful. The artwork's gorgeous. And I, I picked it up. I started reading it. I was like about 100 pages in in an hour. And I thought, oh, wait, huh. wait, 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 pump the brake here. All of a sudden, I realized that, yes, I'm being drawn into it. And it had these segments that just live on their own. Yeah. And. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I was then called to pump the brake, stop, and put it down and go back and enter the desert. Ah, perfect. <laughs> nice. And that blew my socks off. And from a you know, a person that read through Jung's works all on my own, uh, and then you know, been in, involved. And so it reminded me, and I'm not a cult of Jung person at all. In right. fact, I right. detest that that mentality that's taken over so much great stuff. Yeah. In, in, especially in a culture. Uh, but what I mean by this is entering the desert is so multi layered. And there's something for, every, you can enter that work as someone that's just picking up a deep spiritual occultish text and knows nothing and get your world rock. And you can come at it from my perspective, who is someone that's been around a lot of different practices I've devoted myself to and adhered to and, uh, and then found my own, own practice out of that. I'm the same age as you. And, uh, and, and so I, I all of a sudden found myself reading by the sentence, which is what happens to me when I read you. Oh, and, okay. and so I was entering into these little parallel worlds in these small snippets within entering the desert and going, 
you know, at first I'm like, is this intentional? You know, was this the muse in you? Was this, right. what was this that was giving me that same experience? I, I, I've i received that experience with like and, Andrew Chumbly's work and some others. Uh-huh. And and definitely with uh, uh, Apocalyptic Witchcraft is a book too, amazing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it this book is just transformative. And and my point here is, no matter where you are on the continuum, there's something in there for you. And there's doors of perception that are just the same bake in. It's really magical. And it, it there was no moment when it felt the work feels does not feel self conscious. It feels very. Uh, lacking in that egoic state that so much modern a culture has sure. it, it, it feels uh heavily nuanced but in a natural way and it's inviting also at the same time and i like how you present things that seem uh difficult for some people in our modern culture which is finding the self finding silence yeah and and stepping away and how you you know the techno god thing and yeah. all yeah. that so i just i want to come in i want to tell i just want to sing the praises of that that's how i encountered you on instagram <laughs> yeah thank you thank <laughs> because you so i posted my love for your book and our mutual friend montana jordan connected us so that's brilliant wonderful. craig you're brilliant absolutely brilliant yeah. Well, I, re- I appreciate that feedback. Uh, that's actually how the book was intentionally written. So to get an educated reader to just kind of pick that up, it means a lot. And, it, and I'm so happy to hear that because I wanted that book to be um, alive and I wanted it to be a book that would morph depending on where the reader was from, but it would meet them wherever they are and they could also expand it as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. This was a this was a gift to the collective, and especially within. And I detest using this word, but I I find it's a word that works for people. And I can't say it right now. He owns Miskatonic. Sure. Um, he uses it all the time when I've ordered from him. But he's always like, "Thanks for supporting the genre." And mm. so, but within the genre, um, this is this is a standout like that. And so, and I'm someone who has a decent library so with that said let's let's just let's get into this it's, i'm so yeah. glad to have you on um i would like to just start in with your earliest memories within your experience as craig in this world in this kind of democratic reality that we hold down and what what were the things it's democratic that- socialists now <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, well, that's where we are now, but when we were young, uh, uh, where, what are the things that inspired you? And first of all, everyone, he's, there's this NOLA, Bra- New Orleans background. So this is, this is all going to be lovely and juicy, I'm sure. But what are the things that stick out? What are the things you remember now of both pop culture and your inner world that are still with yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that that question was actually the reason that why I wrote Cult of Golgotha, um, is I wanted to take all of the all of these experiences from my youth um, and that heavily influenced me, and then show how I kept them and how I created uh, different unique cult views or esoteric views with that. I, I was very fascinated with Eastern culture, particularly. What we what you would call Hinduism or Vedic studies at an extremely young age, uh, around eleven or twelve, and so I was just fascinated with that. And I grew up fascinated with Asian culture, mainly Chinese through Kung Fu and Qigong, Tai Chi, and things like that. And that eventually, of course, went into you know my field in Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine from India. But as my youth, I was growing up in Louisiana. It's such an eclectic atmosphere, and so I was personally fascinated with Hinduism and Vedic studies, but also I had a deep love for this type of kind of sacramental mysticism, which is steeped all over Louisiana. And I'm sure obviously you can see where the ideas of Golgotha probably kind of came out from that. Um, and then I also loved Crowley and Rudolf Steiner uh, and grew up kind of reading all those things as well too. I, w- I was sent to a Catholic school. We were, we were not Catholic. 
but I loved that environment. And so I was always just kind of immersed in ritual. And of course, Louisiana has that unique kind of like hoodoo and voodoo kind of weird quasi mixtures going on. So to me, it was a perfect environment to grow up in with all my interest. And um, I feel very lucky. I, I often say that I didn't pick these things. They, they kind of picked me. Um, and so I always felt those uh, presences around me. I was open to it. And I just kind of listened to their voice and followed it. And I look back on my life now and it makes, it seems like this beautiful plan. <laughs> but at the time I was just kind of following what seemed to be uh, the right thing to do at the time. I find that's an important uh, note when riding the currents of of this realm is how you said it didn't pick you. you it, it it picked you. You didn't pick it. Right. That that seems to be saying. I call that the synchronistic universe. In sure. That. But yeah. what I wanted to get at with how special New Orleans is and Louisiana, I just keep saying, <laughs> I have such a love for it, is that you were brought up in a spiritualist church, but you go to Catholic school, and that seems so very that area. Yeah, yeah. Because those uh, things that other parts of the South are diametrically opposed. Yeah, you wouldn't see that that mixture in other <laughs> places, for sure. And, and my mother was deeply involved in spiritualism and a type of esoteric Christianity, and that greatly influenced me, but she was also very open-minded. And so I, I just had a perfect environment for all those things to cross pollinate. Um, and although I would say, I mean, ultimately my foundation is in Vedic and Hindu studies. Uh, there was so many other beautiful doorways that opened up in my life that I considered just so special. That's why I wrote Cult of Gogatha because I wanted those to be representative. And I'm glad you picked that up on Cult of Gogatha because each chapter is like a unique little doorway anyone can go into. Um, it's written in a different manner than entering the desert. So I'm glad you felt that. that's very easy to read. It should be very easy to read for that reason. Yeah. Well, it, but don't be deceived because it's easy to read and because oh, it's, it's in, in <laughs> yeah, and it's in these small segments where you can, it's almost like you can bibliomance the book. Yes. Know. Yes. Actually, it was written for that. That's yeah. Very, yeah. And that comes off. So I did not know that. I went in, I went into your world in with a veil i had no idea who you were before i ordered those books like i said i ordered everything they had available and right. was just gonna get down with get down on their stuff and which i'm a fan of other think them and scarlet imprint are truly my favorite publishers right now mm -hmm. uh so i just right, i back. ordered that new book from them which one i don't remember oh from scarlet yeah yeah, I need to get on. Uh, and an anthem has a new one too. Have to, we'll, we'll figure all that out. So, the spiritualist church. What was was it? Pentecostal? Was it Baptist? No, I, it was. I, it, it was a, a a true what they would call spiritualist church in the sense it was a type of just o open esoteric Christianity. Um, it was there. I would think the most probably the originating members were Rosicrucian, and okay. there was a there was a gentleman from Haiti who's a French Haitian Rosicrucian Martinist, and so they kind of guided that, um, and then so, but outside of that, there wasn't necessarily. I definitely wouldn't have been Pentecostal, but it would have been more uh, just overall es what they would call esoteric Christianity. But you know, spiritualist churches are so open and so eclectic. Um, yeah, and yeah, anytime yeah. Anytime you bring in Rosicrucian and Martinism, then it's especially like French Haitian influences, then all yeah. bets are off. It's just everything. Yeah, oh, that's what I find so exciting about those particular churches down there in Louisiana in particular. Uh, yes, I agree. They're I dynamic. Agree. So, also, what was your relationship with, and, and so I'm talking this still in these formative years with mm. the natural world. It was, that was very important for me. You know, I grew up in a, you know, both of us uh, grew up in a generation that it was, I would say, radically more connected to nature. Um, I grew up in forest. I grew up outside constantly. And that was something that really influenced me, um, being out in forest by rivers, natural elements was something that always spoke to me and inspired me. And I'm 
I consider it a karmic blessing to be able to grow up in that area instead of growing up with what I would refer to in entering the desert as the techno god or this constant overblown of technology we have, which is can be helpful. But um, when I was young, it was just constantly a magical universe to me, uh, and I'm sure that informed my vision. That, that's something that I that I felt really made a big difference in how it was formed up. My mother also was very much against tele television, um, and we had we were just always having to read, and I loved to read, and I loved being outside. And so to me, some of my greatest memories as a child is either going to the library and bringing home 20 books or going out camping or in the forest. Um, and of course, that's where my love for trail running came from, my love to run um, in nature. So the, all those things kind of really form it performative for me, and they still are. Those are things that I still feel like people really need a better connection to nature. It's true medicine. Yeah, oh, I, I agree. I agree. It's, it's interesting to see how detached a lot of the modern world is, especially the more packed in, in yes. these cities people are coming. What about your relationship with music? At music, this young age, yeah, music was huge for me, very formative. A lot of people don't know that about me, but from uh, from the age of eleven to I would say my mid twenties, music was a huge part of my life. Um, I was constantly playing in bands. I played guitar, and that was something both classical guitar and then, of course, just rock and blue, blues and Louisiana music were always huge, huge to me. So that was a big part of experiencing reality. Was the language of music and then eventually i started to feel that the language of words and writing uh, was there, were, there was like a linguistic expression of that and i think most of my passion for music kind of morphed into my passion for writing uh, and then just seeing the world in a sacramental way and that's what music does potentially particularly in, in, in india you know india views music as very sacred and or at least has the potential for that so to me, that's kind of what I grew up with. It's a very powerful way for me to stay inspired, change my consciousness, and also be creative. Because I do feel that people are disconnected from creativity as well. That's a big thing. It's a major thing, and um, it is something you address also. And you've addressed in the, a couple interviews I've listened to. I'm I'm wondering also back here in this early bit, I've heard you speak about uh, having had many paranormal experiences as a child and a young yes. person, yes. but I have not heard you speak of what they were. Could you give us an example of, yeah. of your, your, your journeys in the paranormal as an early, you know, in earlier stages of your life? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm rather private about some of that, but I mean, I think part of it has to do with growing up in the environment of Louisiana. That the place is, is there's ghosts and spirits everywhere, literally. And so I think that when I was young, I had, you know, very paranormal experience in the, in the sense of clairaudience, clairvoyance, and then something which became particularly interesting interesting to me was psychometry, which is the ability to hold objects and get images and ideas for them. Those are very important aspects of spiritualism or spiritualist churches. So I had these experiences as a youth of seeing or hearing these things, but I was very lucky in the sense that it, I was, it, it actually inspired me. And then I had people around me who encouraged it and didn't discourage it. And so I think that was a key aspect. My, my mother was very much open to that. My friends in the spiritualist churches were radically encouraging of it. And then, then they gave me a framework. And so I started to have a framework of tools to develop that. And that's probably another reason why, hence my interest in yoga and the esoteric was, I never had these questions as a child of like, oh, is there another reality? Oh, is there something out there? It was more like, no, there is something out there and how can I better communicate with it? And how can I better have a better relationship? With it? And that was something that I formed with that. So, and I think that a lot of people, when they're young, if they have experiences, they're either scared of it or they're shut down or they're told not to talk about it or people just don't believe them and i was lucky that none of that happened to me so, so, so did the psychometry just come on or was it something you developed yeah, it, or that, that was something which seemed to be very natural to me you know when in spiritualist churches they're always trying to what they would call the, they would talk about the gifts of the spirit so they would talk about 
everybody might have a gift of the spirit. And that seemed to be something which was very simple and very easy for me. Um, and, you know, it makes sense if you think about it, because I was constantly using my hands playing guitar. Um, and then now in the medical field and using my hands with acupuncture needles or feeling the pulse, um, or it, it, even in Kung Fu and the movement of that, it's very much a powerful thing. And I think that's, uh, you know, a big part of entering the desert where I wanted people to see the hand is a magical instrument. The, our hands and our eyes are very important magical instruments. Um, and so that was something that, that we do. And then, you know, and it, we speak about the word paranormal, but it's basically, I think that's another reason why I was so drawn to India, because in India, they don't call it paranormal. In India, they just call it yoga. And yes. It's, it's, just, yes. <laughs> it's totally normal. You know, the, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the third pada, the third chapter is just, all it is is a description of all the clairvoyant activities that, are, that will happen to you. We'll say these things are going to happen. Here's an extensive description of it. Move on. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And so that, I think that for me, that was something that really appealed to me. I was like, oh, yes, I was having these experiences too. Um, Hinduism and yogic texts were very open and clear about it. Um, and then that gave me a lot of cool. Why many of the Western systems were kind of struggling, with it, right? Either Christians were downplaying it, or cult groups were saying, "Well, no, it only is this." Or we have more of a secular humanism, which was saying none of it was real. Um, you just didn't have that in India. So I think that was another reason why I was so drawn toward the East, so to speak. I find that a lot of people that do this kind of uh, inner work, whatever pathway they go down or pathways, tend to find that is a a modality, that it's not uh, paranormal. And, and so, you know, in India, there's, it's, it's baked in like that. And right. but in Western culture, it, it's been marginalized and almost sideshow, oh, you know, completely. Completely. I totally agree. Yeah. And, and you can't have that. self-empowered people in the Christian church. I mean, right. Oh yeah, definitely. Right. I, I think in any practice, the, the people that have really applied devotion to, to it, but have also pushed forward with their own ideas right. with that framework. No, I totally agree. And um, I, I think that the, even now, you know, we see people that, you know, exploring the paranormal and the word sometimes loses its meaning. Um, but to me, it's just an, another doorway to an alternate reality. Where that's a, that's, for example, that's a fundamental concept of Tantra. Tantra says that we live in a world with in, an infinite amount of dimensions constantly interpenetrating each other. And then depending on one's level of awareness, you can either be aware of that uh, or you can you know, cross between those dimensions. And that, that's, you know, the Sanskrit word maya would mean that. Is some people have mm -hmm. that covering they can't see. Other people can you know, pull back the curtain of maya and see all that. Um, so, and that, that's why you see so many of the, even the Western or European occult groups were searching for these terms that would go and take these ideas from Buddhism or Hinduism. Yeah, oh you yeah. Help them. Yeah, you can clearly see that. One, and then it became such a pop thing to do in the yes, 60s. Totally. and. What about, okay, so in this early phase, and as we move into uh, the dream framework, yeah. uh, what, so, all right, I try to structure things that, questions around each guest without, I'm trying to give people that just may be coming to conversations like these, uh, a framework to, sit in and not be overwhelmed by so yeah. if I, I uh, sometimes if i sound a little shallow it's because i want to be inclusive in that way so i use common words no, so that's, that's a good way to be yeah i i think so too i i, I don't want to get bogged down uh although personally I do. you know, <laughs> bog me down <laughs> just really quickly to say that was one of the reasons why i wanted to write entering the desert was before I wrote the next volume of Tantric Physics, was because I wanted to write a book that would express these complex concepts out using Sanskrit, out using Eastern ideas, because it's something that so everyone can grasp. Um, and so I think it's important for us to be able to communicate that way. 
Yeah, especially now that language is so contorted it, that it's hard, you know, no, we don't have agreement on common words in the English vocabulary any longer. And so it's becoming increasingly uh, difficult to find bridges of communication with others because of this twisting. So, but okay, so as a child, with all this stuff that we've already ascertained with you, were you, did you have any, what were your fears? You know, the typical stuff is like the thing under the bed or the closet or the dark wood, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. Did you have any of those? No, I think that's really, that's a great question. No, I think these, these things that happened to me, I mean, there might've been, you know, there's an initial fear, uh, you know, like, let's say you, when you're doing martial arts and you have a fight, you might initially be like, oh, this is scary. But then after you've done it a couple of times, you're like, oh, this is no big deal. It's just how it is. Um, and so, and luckily I had such a background in my studies were going on at the same time. So I had these reference points. I had people to go to for questions. No one was telling me that anything was, was horrible or bad. So I didn't really have any fears uh, that, I could, that I can remember. No, it was actually, it was kind of exhilarating, to be honest. It's a lot like sex. Yeah, it was very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> that was very inspiring, very empowering. Um, so I, I, I didn't have fears as a youth. So. so, and then one more thing before we head into this, your early dreamscape. I, I know because I, I've listened to a couple of your interviews. So I said you were involved in Kung Fu early on, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't this yes. very... Um, yes, when I was a, when I was a child, I grew up pretty obsessed with martial arts, and it's still to me to this day. That's something that has stayed with me since I was ten years old. Okay, so you were ten. Yeah, ten or eleven. I think I was when I was begging my parents, please, please let me take kung fu, please let me take karate, all those kind of things. What what it, what drew you to that particular practice? That's a good question. I think, you know, for me, it was just something that called to me. I felt these, this connection to the symbols. I felt a connection to the images. Um, and that the whole culture in general was something where I just felt at home. Um, much the same thing with India. So I think I would have to say it's probably a, some type of karmic connection. Yeah. Because I sure, I sure didn't get it. You know, my, my family was absolutely not interested in any of those subjects. Um, but luckily, they were very encouraging. Um, yeah. So you know that was that which was wonderful. So I had a wonderful, encouraging environment. I, but I had a, I was you know very interested in those things. And that's why I always say, you know, I'll say it's very karmic, or um, I, it picked me. I didn't pick it. You know, we can yeah. use kind of like ways of trying to convey that. But that is really true. That is the, that is the reason I'm very passionate about at, at a young age like that. Yeah, I, I have had those same those same things called to me as well. Gung Fu, especially you know Nag Mai and the Shaolin and all this. Nice. Oh, and uh, and then India, India has been in my soul since I can I I can never separate India out from me, and uh, and then down to antiques in my house and stuff. The old, old the patina. I'm not sure what it is. The the deities. I cannot really find the threads of my tapestry that are specifically india okay. it's so there's so much of it in me yeah, yeah. Uh, but i found that interesting and one of the things i find interesting and specific about gung fu is that it, it's there's such a focus on the internal aspect of why one fights absolutely there's it's not just about, yes, you should, you know, it's good to be a badass. You know, you can protect yourself. That's awesome. That's the surface level. And it, it's the frosting. There is this whole other deep well that goes along with it that is, I think people don't understand until they get into it. I agree. And so I, I've watched, you know, I've watched them come and go. And I lament not having a Sifu around me. I you know, I'm one that does like a teacher <laughs> yeah, <laughs> constantly. It, it's it's very important. I mean, that's how that whole system is conveyed to seafood, a student, discipleship. Um, you know, like we talk about in India, there's a parampara, 
uh, the, the guru and sisha relationship it's the same thing in kung fu mm-hmm. um, i'm sure all those concepts were just such they were just so they, for, they formed my mind space when i was a child and i think that's why when i got older i was able to so naturally enter strange territories um which most people just you know that's a, a very important idea to, to touch upon most people just can't just go to india and feel at home everything's so different you know? mm-hmm. right everything's so radically different and I, and I don't think everyone should everyone needs to find things to call to them and you, you yourself are probably aware you know carl jung talked about this very much and said you know most people are not set to go to the east yeah right who's adamant he, about that he's very adamant about that. so yeah. um so he was also adamant about his whole 80th birthday party and all that about his fear of Jungians. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was the cult of Jung. He yeah. would be horrified, oh, yeah. I oh, think, for sure. <laughs> at what has happened. You think he'd get along with Laura London? I think he probably would, but who, you know, you never know. <laughs> she is right. fantastic. We love her. Yeah, totally. Okay, so with all this said, the, let's talk about how you were as a young person encountering the what were your encounters with the unconscious via the dreamscape and and I say that as someone that comes from the fact that I don't think everything is us I think that there are, are things that drive their own car there are sentiences right, beyond right. us so when So set up the dreamscape as you experienced it early on, because I'm sure it has changed. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the perception of dreaming and dream spaces in in India is is quite radically different than we would say, for example, in Western philosophical or psychological ways. So I I think I was lucky in the sense that I never really explore dreams with the psychological vision so for me it was always more about that these, these dreams are offering some a voice from another dimension or whether we say that or, or this is speaking to me like you just said or no something else is driving the car here it's not just my unconscious so that, that kind of formed so my dream kind of mind space and the dreams eventually kind of came colored with the idea of working with chakras the idea of working with mantras the idea of working with yantras to see how that can work change my brain. Um, and so that became something which really influenced me. And I had a lot of significant experiences with that. And I was never really interested in like lucid dreaming in the sense of trying to control it or out of body experiences or things like that. I was more interested in just having dream experiences when I was studying. So I think that my dream experience was were radically intense and radically inspiring um and and i would write all those down and many of those ended up being things which i can see now were coming out in the cult of Mogatha. and it, and entering the desert came to me in a dream when i was in tibet um so that's something that i you know i received the inspiration for that whole entire book came through a dream and a vision when i was in tibet the, de- the deserts of tibet so I, I think those things are very important to allow them to come into us I think in many ways they possess us. You know, there's a type of possession in the dream space for me. And I allow that's very comfortable for me. It's not anything frightening. I think the only nightmares I've had dream wise are the continual nightmares of, of being in med school <laughs> or college. <laughs> of course. Like, I, you know, I still have nightmares about it. I'm like, I can't believe I, I registered for biology and I never went. So I'll occasionally have those, um, which just comes with being in school for so long. Um, but other than that, um, I find my dreams to be very inspiring, and I'm, I kind of let them go where they need to go. Um, I don't try to control it, just like life. I don't try to control it. I just kind of try to ride it. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a concept I'm always trying to get at for people. Keep your knees weak. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you you said something provocative that. I love, and I'm, I know I'm going to love this perspective of yours, but possession within the dream. And I, I know after having read these books and your connection to the work of Bertio sure. and um, also Louisiana and the, your connection, your proximity to, you know, voodoo and, sure. and sure. voodoo and all that. 
uh, which use that whole concept and dynamic and experience, most importantly, uh, in a in a in a more positive light than say yeah. the Catholic Church and and some other of the Judeo stuff. So when you when you speak about it in context to the dream state, can you give us an idea, walk us through some of the mechanics of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I'll, I'll, you know, quickly, I'll say that, you know, you brought up Michael Bertio. It's, a, I think, one of the reasons why I was the strange and often disturbing world of Michael Bertio and Esoteric Budon was, was very easy for me, but for various reasons. Number one, because growing up in Louisiana, uh, particularly Lafayette, there was a heavily, heavily French uh, influence. And so you had the French, even Haitian occult streams kind of coming through, which heavily influenced Bertro. And then that whole idea of the hoodoo world was there too. And then also this strange mix with Christianity. So by the time I encountered the work of Michael Bertro, which most people think is completely bizarre, to me, it actually kind of made sense only because of my background. And so those cultures, uh, particularly many of the Haitian cultures, when surrealism kind of went into those areas, they were very open to the idea of these, the loa or the spirit family is kind of communicating us through dreams and entering us through dream spaces and dream states. I think we see that now. A lot of people are constantly struggling with these ideas about um, these disturbing dream experiences or paralyzed during their dreams and having these entities around. And oftentimes because they're, they're, their everyday reality can't even accept basic changes. And so their dream space becomes even more threatening when oftentimes it's just a type of, I would say, alien intelligence, not in the sense of an alien in the UFO, but an alien in the sense from another dimension outside of ours. So for me, if I was working with rituals, if I was working with different things, I would work to communicate with a certain discarnate intelligence particularly from India, through, the, through specific mantras and through specific yantras, which you could visualize while you were falling asleep, and then to practice through meditative states, particularly through a practice called Pratyahara and Dharana and Dhyana. Those two things came together called Samyama. You, you, you notice I mentioned that in the Cult of Agatha. I would often say, this is not a spiritualism, it's Samyama. It's this idea of these Vedic things coming together which was literally allowing us to use a different type of perception of reality. Our senses were transformed into doorways. So I worked deeply with, you know, years and years of working with mantras and meditation to really crystallize that vision so that when we entered a dream state, we could know what was happening. I often use the analogy of night vision, the idea that we have to, our eyes have to get used to the night. Um, and so that, that's a very important concept in esoteric or in entering the desert. I use the phrase sacramental vision, the idea that we were literally transforming the way we see and experience reality. So that sacramental vision is carried over into the dream space as well, too. So once, but that, that means someone has to make a concert, like a concerted effort to really master meditation, really work with mantras, find teachers that can help you work with the visualization of the yantras. And then as a result of that, when one enters their dream space, because you have to, I, I would touch on this quickly. I would say that sleep is a type of death. And so I, I, our, when we go to sleep, our waking consciousness is dying. You know, if someone would see us at sleep, we would look like a corpse, most people, right? And they, they're laying flat. And so then we enter in a different realm. And so it's a type of dream space. So much how Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that whatever you think at the moment of death determines your next reality. It's the same thing with dreaming. Whatever you're thinking or concentrate at the moment when your awaking consciousness drifts off to a deeper state, that determines how easily you will enter into another experience. And so I was always working with that. That's also a fundamental idea of Tantra, is that we, through our lifetime of practice, a lifetime of ritual work, a lifetime of radical work with different practices, um, some dangerous, some scary, some totally normal, that we are able to strengthen our awareness so that at the moment of death, we not only 
do not have fear, but we can keep our awareness and then we can cross over into another realm with awareness, not in fear and not in fear. So the dream state and sleep are very much the same way. That's one of the reasons why in entering the desert, I talked about the importance of like sacred sleep, right? The idea of the ritual. We, should, we need to make sleep, the space of sleep, a very ritualistic, sacred experience. Oh, yeah. I, I love it. I enter it in love every, every moment that I, I cross over into that. And I, I would like to take a little meander with you on the moment of death, the thoughts that are moving through. And if so for people that are doing this work, it's it, no matter, you could be getting savagely brutalized and should, and, you know, a master will be able to just hone in on breath and move through right. with the thoughts they create. But when we, so if we bring this back to say people that are not doing the work, you know, and for whatever reason, right. someone has a terrible death and how does that, how do you see this? Uh, because it's really a speculation. And but how do you see that as moving through to the next chapter for those people that may be dying in utter horror? That's an absolutely um, fascinating question. And I think that there's numerous things we can touch upon that. I think, I, I think that the most uncomfortable thing we would have to discuss first which makes a lot of people get very uncomfortable is the idea of karma. And so yes, from, but know, we, so, we love being uncomfortable here. Yeah. So I think that the karmic thing that will, we're pretty much, particularly a, an aspect of karma called Parabdha karma. And Parabdha karma is the karma that we have to experience. There's like, there's, and karma is much more complicated than most people understand. It's not just this one overall arching. There's, there's this idea of Sanchita karma, which is this large kind of like vast bank account of and, and sometimes an infinite number of lives that we have we that we would draw upon in each incarnation uh, is like a single withdrawal from that. And that's called our Parabdha karma. And that's something that we can't change. Well, we, we might want to call that fate or or destiny. And those are the things we have to experience. There might be a new nuanced way of experiencing it. You know, I always tell people you might experience this event with a different t-shirt on or a different haircut, but you're still going to experience that event. And then we have a, a different, another type of karma called agami karma, which is this instant karma. That's instant karma. Maybe someone punches me in the face. And so there's a reaction from that instant. We don't have to wait a lifetime for a reaction from that. And so I think the parabda karma, the karma we have in this lifetime, is extremely mysterious. I would say extremely disturbing and also extremely exhilarating. And so that's what one of the reasons in Tantra, we're, we're always trying to radically refine our awareness, particularly in practices of agora um, and initiatic agoric experiences that we're trying to experience mm -hmm. radical states of death gnosis or radical states of non-dualistic perception. And then while we and while we're doing these practices, then we were able to achieve an, a mind space which sees everything as equal. And that's that's an important part. That'll be a huge part of contrary physics too. Sacred body, sacred space. A huge part of my work in the Agora traditions. And that's a huge part of our awareness of realities that not everyone's going to have a beautiful death or or what we might call a beautiful death. Um, but there's still a beauty in all death. But there can be horrifying experiences in the world, and there can be beautiful experiences. And that's what we have to kind of just accept in this dimension. And so that's one thing. And so now, whether or not someone can keep their awareness at the time of death is very hard. That requires a lifetime of practices. So it's a very sobering discussion, too, because it means that we would say, you know, it's much like uh, we could use the Kung Fu example, you know. Most people are not going to train martial arts serious enough to be able to use it, honestly. Most people are not going to be able to train martial arts enough to where if they were walking down the street in New Orleans and then someone instantly attacked them, 
most people would not be prepared to instantly turn on without any concern and just spontaneously react. But martial artists will spend a lifetime trying to cultivate what we would call an unconscious competence to just spontaneously react and, and, and do something that only comes through a lifetime of practice. So, you know, as martial arts teachers, we're always trying to tell that to people, like, this is very serious, like, you need to practice this because it's not just going to be there if, you know, if you need it, you don't practice it. Well, our spiritual practice is the same way. Someone that wants to have some type of awareness, some type of concentration at the moment of death, they have to make a huge effort in their lifetime to cultivate concentration, to cultivate focus, to start to remove fear from their life, to have death perception and contemplation of death. And these are things that we can obviously see from a Western perspective are radically discouraged, right? We don't want to talk about death. We don't want to see death. We're completely manipulated by fear as a culture. And so these things, uh, and so yeah. what happens at the moment of death after that, then, you know, there's always a recycling. And the, the soul, it, it continues on in its own journey, but then the potential for what journey it takes after that, that's particularly what is interesting to the tantric practitioner. They'll get practitioners, they seek something else. They don't, for example, they don't, they don't want to come back to samsara unless they want it. Uh, they'd like to explore other dimensions or complete other, you know, karmic things. We have like that. So it's a fascinating discussion. It's very multi-layered. Um, and in car, as they say in the Vedas, even the karma is so complex, even the gods don't understand. Truly, I, you know, I read in the eighties a book was gifted to me. For a left hand, a path of God. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I can't yeah. remember. Uh -huh. Oh man, I mean, I think it's hard to find now. Anyway, and of course, it came to me through a mysterious and beautiful way, and through my. Uh, Indian, the, oh, this whole Indian thing, and uh, but what led me to that pathway was the dark goddess, sure. and and the and that that dark goddess energy, uh, which uh, you know I've devoted my life to, and but find, bringing it into balance and not yes. add, you know, and so I I find. So conversations around death and, and death has always been, is like a friend to me. It, it's part of the basis of all my magical praxis. Uh, it's something I draw energy from mm -hmm. that, and, and work into. And, uh, and for me, this has just been natural. So there's never been any fear involved in that. And I, I, I recognize the fear in other people and I've seen people, I've visually been around the deaths of some that I've loved that did not go in a peaceful way. They yes. were not not happy about it and and fought it. And I could just feel this sense of dread. Mm -hmm. It was happening. I was one and you know, that's when after they've left the shell, the room feels sick. Yes. And then the beautiful deaths I've been around, the room feels empty. Right. Like they're not there. Like they just move, they've just just whatever has happened that, you know, I'm not sure what has happened, but there's this, there's not a thick there. And uh, there's still the sense, the quality, the feel, the presence of that, but it's not, it's not thick, beautiful and effervescent. Uh, but so what I'm getting at with that is in, in the dream state and how you've experienced these portals, mm -hmm how have you and I, so i'm asking this about the dark guys because i i've listened to a couple of your interviews as i said earlier so i'm i'm front loaded in some of this information appreciate that uh the dark goddess and in particular i think kali was was one of your is montana would say one of your booze and uh. <laughs> montana and uh how has she in come forth through the dream has she come forth through the state of dreaming when she was first introducing herself to you? How did you come upon her breath? To me, yeah, the dark goddess in the in the what, what we would talk about the the tradition which I was initiated into and study was the Dasha Mahavidya's twelve wisdom goddesses, which are these magnificent kind of 
multi-dimensional expressions of the dark goddess that kind of morph out of Kali. On some traditions, they morph, they morph out of Tara. Depends on where they were kind of grounded in. But actually, when I was a young child, I had uh, it was not a dream. It was um, just a, a actual, whether someone would want to call it paranormal, supernatural, or a vision of um, of, of Dumavati, which was, which is one of the most terrifying. So that actually might have been the only one of the most terrifying experiences I had as a child, but it it radically changed my perception of reality, which is what she's supposed to do. <laughs> and so that happened to me. And, and you know, since you've read the um, Agora by Swoboda, I mean, he speaks about that. Vimalananda talks about when Tara appeared to him, like literally appeared to him. It wasn't in his it wasn't in his mind's eye, like literally the jackal transformed into the goddess right in front of me. So I had an experience like that as a child, and that probably set the course for my entire life. Um, and then I, at that point, that's when I realized, okay, this is a different reality than most people are perceiving. That's probably a karmic experience. And then so now, of course, everything that I write, everything that I do, I consider it it's done in the womb of the dark goddess I often speak of that. And we all exist within the womb. Um, um, and then that goddess, is, it's, it's a beautiful expression of Shiva and Shakti. And he's more of out of Sri, Sri Krishna, the so Krishna and Radha, which is the most beautiful expression of, of the divine, cosmic, feminine, male intermingling. And so all those are kind of this multidimensional expression of that. So that's what drew me to that. But no, it was a radical, what I would call real experience where something was something was there <laughs> and so can you that, share more of that experience are you are you willing to yeah i mean this i mean when i was a, a child and i had studied um some hindu's texts and sacred texts and, and was working with some mantras and i had s some friends who were from india and then i had a radical experience during a meditation experience where dumavati a, a literally appeared to me and then that radically at the time i didn't understand who she was um and, and then that's she said some things to me which were very confusing to me that i of course remembered and then as i then as i looked at what she said to me then i realized i was able to figure out okay that's doom of Bhati, and then who she was and then that's a was a radically changed my perception of reality radically changed my perception of life radically changed my perception of of life and death both and so that for better or for worse right i mean that's not necessarily a great thing <laughs> at, a, at a 12 year old life um so i was lucky that it happened a bit in a way within an environment that um i didn't go crazy or i didn't i, I wasn't really scared i mean i was scared at, at the moment of the experience of it and then when it was done it was like okay that was significant okay that's something i need to pursue study and then that of course that set the course of my entire life to, to the point where now I'm 50 years old and we're talking about it <laughs> and I'm, you know, and I'm 50 years old and writing Tantra physics volume two, which will be a significant expression of all the tantric goddesses and how they act in our world and how they act in our life um, and how they morph. Out of that. And, but, but the awareness of death and its awareness of, of shocking reality of that um, was huge. Yeah. And, I remember quick one thing I will say is I do remember as a child after that experience because one of the things which was so interesting to me as a child was in Louisiana they they, they mostly had open casket funerals um, and at the and so you would go to the funeral and the the body would be the body would be there right and and so as a child I remember seeing that and thinking ah oh, that's like my experience that's what I experienced. And so that radically changed my perception of that even to this day. Um, and that's funny. That's why that's how I ended up being friends with Layla Wendell from um, Our Name is Melancholy, who wrote an introduction to Cult of Gogatha, was eventually, you know, was able to share those experiences with her in my youth. Uh, she was in the Westgate House in New Orleans. Um, way, 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 way pre-Katrina. Um, so. It's interesting about the open ca I only encountered corpses that weren't in experiences where I was right there when the person died, right. but in open caskets. And so I, it is, it, I guess I'm 
I guess I'm just, I feel like that's a normalcy, but perhaps that was my normalcy in years down yeah, there. I would agree. Yeah. It's, yeah, for sure. I think it just depends on where you grew up and who allowed you to see what, what you were shielded from. Yeah. You know, those, those types of things. But I think those, those can be, that's even in the agoric practice. We seek to radically confront death, to have the rituals and the smash on and to have these experiences because each time you have that experience, it changes your perception of reality. It tends to, it tends to burn away egoic blocks. Yeah. And, it's and that's, very that's important. It, you know? Yeah. It, it's magically transforming it, it, it on such a deep level that, you know, that it, sadly in, in contemporary Western culture, which is where we are, uh, you know, there are, there are just, there's so much fear and yes. in yes. this creation of safety and which is doing nobody any justice, especially on a, on spiritual levels of, of seeking growth. We yes. we must we must walk towards fear. Yeah. And 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 danger is, is a good sign. It's all about how you navigate it. And that's yeah, that whole keep great. your knees weak. Uh, yeah. so okay, so give us an example of how the dreamscape looks to you. Like the architecture of it, is it, you know, you still say, is it black and white? Do you smell? Are you able to read? Yeah, I think that all the senses absolutely do because it, this, these, a uh, quote, you know, dream experiences like this, they're, they're, they're happening through the, the different koshas of the body. There's different aspects. You know, we have the physical body, we have a pranic body, there's a mental body, there's some, there, there's a, body of emotions and so in, particularly in ayurvedic medicine and yoga practices we learn to use each of those koshas or each of those bodies to navigate different realms and so that you would use that and that then with your when your experiences from those bodies everything is the same way as we would have here if you've worked to develop that so then you would see smell taste all the other things would happen uh, if one has worked to kind of do that that way if not then you know, the dreams can be just kind of uh, just a melange of what you happen during the day, right? That would be maybe the nights I have my, you know, dreams of nightmares of, you know, not registering or registering for biology and never going. That's not a yogic experience. That's just kind of a defragmenting of my mind. It's done something we would call that in yoga. Those are just some scars. Those are things, repeated habitual behaviors I did. They just become ingrained in my brain. And might actually literally become ingrained and imprinted in our nervous system. But for the different kind of navigate different doorways in the dreams, which is what we seek to do in Tantra or in agoric practices, we want to use those because they're potential doorways into other levels of reality, which we can explore for, in the sense of communicating with other intelligences to receive information, or we can explore to help break down limitations we have in our everyday the awake, awakened level of reality. And so then we can explore even different aspects of our ritual practice. Uh, we can take mantras into those dream state. We can take yantras into those dream spaces. And then when that happens, then we're able to truly enter into some very mysterious realms um, of other dimensions, other time streams. Uh, and then that becomes hopefully something. I mean, the point of that is not just to do it for kicks. I mean, what's the point of that is to do these experiences so that, so that when we come back to this reality, we're transformed, period. There's, that's the only reason why it's done. So that when we come back here, I have a more radical vision of what I want. I have a more clear vision of this reality. And then hopefully I have a better perception of how to help people and how to live out my own karma in a way it is most beneficial to me and both beneficial to anyone around me um, with that aspect. And so that's, that's essentially what when we talk about the dark goddess, all these things are happening under this, under the guidance, under the, within the womb of the dark goddess. And she kind of dispenses our karma to us. And so we can use even dream spaces to help dissolve karma, to live out karma, so that we don't have to experience certain things in the exact same way in this lifetime. That's particularly very tantric right there that we would do. We want to use the dreams in a way that's beneficial um, instead of just, we don't, I'm not concerned about what my dream's telling me. 
about my childhood or some kind of quasi mundane thing. Those things that's not even a concern with me in the dream. The dream space is I'm more concerned about is it opening doorways and other realities that I can navigate, use, communicate with, and then also ground and bring back and then somehow create something with that too. I mean, that, that was actually my vision of Colta Golgotha was that each chapter was like, was a doorway into another dimension. And it's almost like as you read the book, you're traveling down a hallway and you can look in each chapter and it's like another doorway to another dimension. You could just go in there if you want, or you can pass it up if you want. There and then that's kind of that's all influenced by all these experiences that I had as a child, taking them into my youth, and you know, taking all these experiences, traveling to other countries, traveling to other cultures, you know, deeply working with that and then taking it back. Because I think that dreams have a great potential for us, but also the fundamental idea of yoga was that we needed to really understand that dreams also want real that we're always seeking to go a little bit deeper uh, um, so dreams that's why even like for example the teacher ramana maharshi would talk about the dreamless sl- sleep called shashupi in sanskrit it's like oh and the dreamless sleep is the deepest aspect of sleep uh, and so that was sometimes the most refreshing that we were going into literally a state of deep non-egoic perception that was very healing we have that. And I think we can see this now. I mean, as a medical practitioner, one of the most fundamental problems we see is sleep disorder. It's one of the number one reasons for uh, prescription medication is sleep disorder. So there's so our relationship with sleep in general, to me, is a fundamental precursor to our relationship with dreams. Um, and we have to see dreams uh, or sleep as a sacred ritual. We have to see sleep as a sacred medicine. And once we understand that, then we have the potential to go deeper. Um, but if someone's having trouble with sleep and then they're then the whole aspect of them exploring their dreams is tricky, unless they're doing working with extensive systems. And so it's these are fascinating concepts to discuss. What what is your idea on um what's termed over here dream yoga? What what was that now? I'm sorry? What are your thoughts or uh, your ideas on what we term over here is the practice of dream yoga? Dream yoga. You yeah. see a little bit more of the practice of dream yoga within Tibetan streams of Tantra and Tibetan systems of uh, of practice. They really sought to use the dream space as different realms to refine the level of uncon- what they would call the level of unconditioned awareness. Um, in the Vedic and the yogic, uh, or rather Hindu, esoteric Hinduism and Vedic systems, they were a little bit less concerned with dream states per se, but they were they would almost explain, say, in the sense that okay, these these dream experiences might spontaneously happen, but don't get caught up in them. They would often say the dream states were they're an experience. You can experience them and learn from them, but they too could also be addictive. It can also be very, um, it, it, it depended a lot, for example, on the health of our nervous system. This is a great point to discuss. So if someone wants to explore their dreams from a perspective of, of Vedic or Ayurvedic, then they, were, they would have to really have a healthy nervous system. And so they would have to really work to have a clean diet. And if they were using any type of substances with, which altered their perception of reality, whether it was cannabis, whether it was alcohol, whether it was uh, prescription drugs, then right there, their dream experiences were already tainted. They would say then at that point, they would say, okay, all bets are off on whether or not you're literally even experiencing a normal reality. I talk about this often. I mean, you know, there's, there was a really wonderful and depressing article in the, the a British medical journal this past month or two when they talked about all the different types of prescription medication and their mind-altering effects that people are experiencing that they don't even experience reality normally anymore because of all the medications they take. For example, pain medications dramatically lower the rate of empathy. So people just have less empathy for, the, for, for anyone, for themselves, for their family, much less for someone they hate or disagree with. And so if they're on prescription antidepressants, 
if they're taking pain medications, all that affects their level of awareness, their consciousness. So when they enter the dream state, that's already messed up even more. So from a yoga, they would take it pretty radically in that yoga perception. They would say, okay, if you wanted to explore the dreams, then we had to start purifying the nervous system. We had to start improving, grounding the nervous system, calming it, balancing it, cleansing it. And that's where the Ayurvedic medicine or yoga psychology, and then the, particularly within the dream yoga of, of Tibetan practices, that was taught within a system of like tantric practitioners or yogic practitioners where they had studied and done things extensively. That wasn't something that if you just stopped at a, at a food store in Tibet or at a bar in Tibet and said, tell me about your dream yoga, most people are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You'd have to go to the monastery and they would talk about it there. So I think it, there's, it's a, such a complex idea, the level of like our everyday awareness, how pure is that? And then how pure is our nighttime awareness how pure is that? And then our dream awareness. So we're always trying to kind of filter that. We're always trying to alchemically purify our consciousness so that when we do have experiences. They're less and less filtered through preconceived notions, conditioned ideas. It's, you know, the idea of polishing the mirror so that it can reflect something. All these kind of come into play. So I think that's one of the fundamental things with the Eastern systems is they're always looking at these tools of yoga, of tantra of Ayurveda to refine the body. That's why, you know, the next tantric physics is called sacred body, sacred space, in the sense that we have all these different bodies, the mental body, the physical body, the emotional body, the spiritual body, the psychological body. All those are sacred bodies, literal, literal bodies. They're also literal spaces. And so we have to purify them. And if we can purify them and balance them, then they can become domains of experience where we can communicate with other dimensions, other realities, and live out our karma in a balanced way. Um, so those are, you know, we can get into complicated words really quickly, but that's essentially what we're trying to do. And then hopefully you have an awareness. If you're able to keep your awareness in a dream state, then at the moment of your death, you're able to keep your awareness too. That is, um, which is the greatest gift. Yeah, I agree. It's beautifully said. And it, it's, this is, to me, this is more controversial than than talking about the idea of karma. Actually, is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be, because where we are and in this culture, I think uh, I and maybe a couple people I know are the only people I I everyone around me is on some sort of medication. I am not. Yes. And uh, and uh, you know, and I go down these natural modalities myself. Sure. So sure. I guess if you consider herbs and stuff, uh, sure, sure. but it is, it is the elephant in the room more so than, than speaking karma and this other stuff is this idea of your physical temple yeah, and what one's putting in it. And then the clarity in which comes out because of what one's putting in it. Exactly. And, and I am, I, I'm a hundred percent free will with everything. So you you know you rock it the way you need to rock it, and absolutely. You see, we absolutely. all find our pathways. I totally agree. And so totally. that's why I don't preach on this stuff. Although I have, I've been preaching in the past when I I learned something and I got so excited. I'm like, you should this just changed my life. You know, just finding <laughs> certain certain herbs. You know, sure, through Arabic sure. stuff or Chinese stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that that turned me around. And so then you get excited. And you want it turns people off. I uh, so, but this is my experience now in encountering people. I really, from looking at my life, I'm noticing less and less clarity in people around me. Yeah. And, and I try to maintain myself away from the idea of judgment when I say, well, this person's, uh, morbidly obese. So I see that they're, you know, I can yeah, see yeah, the yeah, insulin sure. factor here. I yeah, can see for sure. Yeah. you know, the torp liver and the, all mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And, and so that's what I'm encountering and not the person within. Yeah. Absolutely. And, but now I factor it, there's less clarity yeah. in people. And I'm, I'm constantly trying to find the bridge. How do you, and you're a medical practitioner. How wow. do you get to a clear, my wolf is barking. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was really cute. My uh, it's making my dog bark over here too. So, um, no, I mean, I think that's what well, that's a fundamental uh, subject which I constantly talk about and uh, that informs every aspect of my for sure esoteric practice, but also my daily life is that the physical body is 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 a vehicle for our consciousness. It's a vehicle for our experience. And so we want it to be healthy in the sense of balanced functioning. And that's very hard to do if someone is taking a lot of substances. Now, the problem with this is that, and you know, this is interesting because I'm speaking here from an agoric perspective and a tantric perspective where we might, and someone might say, well, you practice left-hand tantra or you're initiated agora, and you're sitting here telling me that if someone's on medication, it's going to change their alternate or their experience of reality. And that's a, a very good point. The point is, is that these practices of Tantra and the practices of Agora are done after 25 years of spiritual preparation. And then they're, they're, it's like a, it's the same thing as Gung Fu. It's like if someone's going to go fight someone at a high level, they do all of this experience to get ready for it. And they can handle it a little bit better. Plus, they just, they know what's going to happen. Like it's like when you have a fight. No, nope, I always like to say nobody wins a fight. Everyone's hurt. Even if you quote win a fight, you're hurt, and that's just how it goes. So you know when you start that, I'm gonna this is gonna hurt. So even when you from an agoric perspective or a tantric perspective, there's going to be um, a karmic a karmic debt that you incur, um, or we say you know in, in esoteric Buddhism or or even French Haitian Voodoo, like nobody rides for free. I mean, there's a, there's a, you pay for everything. So if someone has prepared their body and prepared their, their mental state to take certain substances, and, and if those substances are deeply connected to nature, then you're going to get a little bit closer level of clear perception. The further we pull back from that, the more clouded the perception gets. You know, if someone is a Native American taking peyote in a mental church ritual, it's going to be distinctly different from someone taking ecstasy in a dance club that was made in someone's bathtub um, that was sold by something else. Or if someone was taking some kind of sacred plant, which was purified after nine months of an alchemical tantric practice, an Ayurvedic practice, versus someone who was taking cannabis that was sold through a drug cartel in Mexico, right? There's going to be a completely different karmic experience, completely different kind of karmic imprint on the consciousness from that. Then if we get into prescription medications, which are synthetically made in laboratories, then all bets are off. Yeah, that and see, this, the thing about me with that stuff in particular, too, is I just, I don't trust these people making this stuff. Right, right. And, and so, especially with like big pharmaceuticals, like I, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's got an agenda. It just does. So, but to get back to the, the dreaming realm, um, when you encounter, this all plays into it. So this plays in the clarity of the experience of dreaming. Yeah, absolutely. Without and, a doubt. Yes. And so where this was taking me was when you personally encounter other in the dream that's, right. in, that's also sentient like you right how do you experience that well it would depend that would depend on which which we would call in ayurveda which kosha or which container or which body that you were kind of perceiving your awareness in um, and obviously, it's typically not going to be the physical body in a dream state, but it could be through the pranic body, uh, which some people kind of sometimes call the astral body. Then you get into weird kind of quasi-theosophical mumbo-jumbo. Um, I prefer to say the pranic body um, or the, the pranic kosha because that's typically some type of energetic experience of our nervous system, which still works through our brain or still functions through the nervous system so we can have an awareness. And in that body, we still have a sense of a higher refining of the senses. So you do see, you do feel, you do experience um, everything we have here, depending on how much you've worked developing. Um, because the senses can be doorways that can be purified. 
that's what we do in Tantra. We use all the senses in a sacred ritual, taste, smell, sight, touch, hearing. All we, we use all of those to try to start to refine them and alchemically purify them so that when we have these experiences, they'll function a little bit clearer. And then sometimes that just comes through karma. Sometimes that comes through practice. Sometimes it comes through initiation. And that you're get, you know you're given certain keys or certain things, and that just works through a whole kind of spiritual tradition that you kind of pull from. But no, those then you experience the dream, the dream experience, the alternate reality, just as you would experience it here, um, and not so much. And, and, it, and it could be maybe slightly different in the images, but if you refined your awareness, then it's very clear. The less refined your awareness is, the, the more strangely symbolic it can be and you it's almost like it's being filtered through a different perception then you have to kind of decode it right that's what most people are having to do they're like i had this dream i don't understand what this meant and you you know can you help me understand what these symbols mean this and then it, from a tantric perspective we're like i don't want to have to decode symbols i want to perceive the dream experience directly and so we start to radically start to purify the sight the taste the smell and that's those work through the chakra. Each one of those senses is connected to the five elements, which is connected to all the chakra system, which is connected to what we call the planets or the grahas. That's where Vedic astrology comes in. And so we're we're using all these systems to balance to harmonize so that we can more clearly experience alternate states of consciousness. And I will say this: that's a great segue because from a tantric perspective, what you're seeking is to radically transform your awareness without any substance, that without using anything, without having to take anything, without having yes. to, that's the whole point, is that eventually you don't need anything. Yes. My experience of reality is already radically so different. I don't need to take another substance for that. And actually, more often than not, most practitioners, true practitioners of Tantra, or true agoris are taking substances to ground themselves into this reality, not to travel to something else. They're more like a living in already living in multiple dimensional perceptions, and sometimes they need a substance just to ground themselves back to everyday reality. And even then, they still have a they they, they feel it. They're like, oh yeah, this makes me nauseous, or this makes me this, but it grounds me, and I can I can just go ground it for a little bit. And so, so it's in most often and I used to get away from or you know to have a little bit of break, not to to have some kind of experience. And I mean our culture is completely glamorized. The drugs is the only way to experience an alternate reality, which I think is criminal. I think it's very um it's it's clearly a part of what we call a counter initiation, uh, archonic systems of control. It's this myth that the only way you can alter your perception of reality is to take some type of stuff. Thank you, CIA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and so from the Eastern practices, they were doing things that they eventually they didn't need to do that. But we, it's almost like people can't accept that now. They're like, that's impossible. Or I refuse to believe that Soma from the Vedas was anything except a plant that they smoke or hallucinogenic mushroom. And while tantric practitioners, practitioners are like, no, Soma is an excretion it happens in our bodies when we do certain things. This is already in there, um, but our many people in the contemporary culture just can't even conceive of that. They think it has to be something else. And then I think a lot of people are really suffering. I think a lot of people are very depressed. I think a lot of people are, are living in emotional, psychological anxiety and pain, and they're seeking substances to stop that pain. And that's I understand that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's either good for you or that at the end of the day it doesn't help anything. Um, so it's, a, it's yeah. pretty controversial. It's a, good, it's a very complex subject. Well, I, it's definitely when we look at how what the outer world is, because we're, we're all participating in the outer world. Right. And, and when we look at how it's rolling out, right, you know, at any given time, it, we're in the we're in the nowness, so we look at it now, and it's understandable to see why people would find themselves in fear, and uh, why people find themselves in all these positions that are not very yeah. empowering. And yeah. uh, and and so 
you know, we have choices within that. And that that's part of what's feeding this this uh grand theater that we that we're all part of. And but I can't help but connect it with these other states of consciousness, these other realms of being. Right. And, and and dream is the dream state, that particular gate of consciousness is such a an easy route to eventually get yourself somewhere else. Yeah. It, it's like a vehicle. It's like getting in a car. Yeah, and for sure. and if we if, if one's able to navigate, find them a map work, a structure, a practice, and then get in that tool, which is the car of dream of dream. Yeah. Uh, then it's possible to start to confront things that may seem overwhelming in this apparent Maya of reality. Right. I totally agree. And work it out there. And so for that, I see it as a wonderful vehicle. But as a, as a long time uh, worker, you know, a hunting woman, stuff, I guess, I, you know, as a long time yeah. person that's worked on herself, the, the dream car is a place to take me in incredible incredible distances to new doors of perception to new right. gateway and and that's where i use it now but it's you know i didn't come in doing that yeah definitely and that's the point i'm always trying to make with people doing hard work and and even just saying tonight i'm going to remember my dreams even at that very first step right oh absolutely i mean i think that doing that and then taking having meticulous dream journal and meticulous magical journal is crucial that if someone would do that alone it would start to alternate but most people i I haven't done that i can't have a habit that uh you know that these are simple things we're talking about you can start to do to radically have um interesting experience so i totally agree sometimes they, they, they but they have to be done they have to be done consistently for month after month after month and year after year and something really good to happen. well and again this is a sign of the times you know like safe spaces and all this everyone's winter right. and all that this is again this is the construct around us which is like uh, you know the pharmaceutical industry and all that yeah. that is keeping us from ourselves i, I totally agree yeah. and and what do we find when we start tapping into ourselves and of course the gateway of dreams it's a good way to start as i've always said is we find that we're immortal yeah and and there's a lot of baggage around that word and i continue to throw the same word out immortal 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 Mm -hmm. because i'm reclaiming that word and uh i don't care how much baggage there is around it there's something powerful to that idea Oh, absolutely. And and that starts to permeate into the flesh, into the fleshly temple, into oh, down here into this realm and on this plane. But and, and so to get back to the idea of when you're in in the dream realm, encountering others that are not you but they're others. So they're mm-hmm. you know, they're driving their vehicles too. How sure, do sure. how do you actually experience Experience them like practically like so you're in you're in your dream and uh, now i realize that this is you may have to go back a bit so you, you you mean you you're a deep worker you're you're an adept in my opinion uh, you're a sifu you know mm. uh but what were your first encounters with others where you knew that this is not you this is a sentient yeah. being well i think that, that that's a good question too that's uh, that's also a fundamental concept of Tantra is that, you know, this reality that we call it is peopled with uh, many different types of intelligences, both incarnate and discarnate. And so some are very friendly, some aren't, just like walking into a city. Some people are be nice, some people aren't. So you have to kind of just be very clear about your personal boundaries and who you are. And you have to have a clear perception of who you are, um, which is a very important idea. 
um, if someone is comfortable with who they are, then their perceptions within the dream and alternate reality is much easier. If someone is not comfortable with who they are, they go into alternate or discarnate or experience of discarnate, it can be very disturbing because they're not even sure who they are, much less who this other intelligence is in front of they can easily manipulate And that's where we can get things like ethical parasites, vampiric, bad consciousness, and kind of seek the ego. And so people need to be aware of that. And that's off to be in a very special systems or esoteric systems that practice the purification, actual damage, and if they're involved. And so I think you need to find some tradition all about it. And then whatever that tradition is, whether it's from the east or the west, and then use the tools um, for people, or use these tools to help, you know, clear out things to refine their awareness and become more grounded in their reality. So that when they have the dream experiences, um, it is more simple and better. Because some dream experiences with other intelligence might be disturbing, but I have disturbing experiences often with just, I'm more concerned about people in this dimension than I am things in other dimensions. So I think if people just are a little bit more aware of that uh, and, and, and a little bit developing their own clear boundaries, in everyday life that can carry over into their dream space. And then they have to, like you mentioned that you nailed it, Ex exploration of alternate states of consciousness is not necessarily safe. And so we, you have to be comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable with that, then you, you shouldn't do it. Um, that's the reason why we have traditions and initiations, because not only people tend to think that these initiations and these things are, or like special in the sense they give you keys or, or secrets, but what they're mainly giving you is often just more protection. They're just basically giving you some kind of, kind of like lifeboat or a, a, a kind of like a, a raft to hold on to or a rope to hold on to so that you're not going to get lost. And then you have to do the work. And then if something bad happens, at least you have some kind of safety net there, which is the tradition, which usually gives you some kind of cool. So I think hopefully that makes sense. Hey, your audio was breaking up there a bit. Okay. When you're talking, I don't know if you're running on a computer or a phone or something. Not just regular computers. Is that clear now? It is. Uh, you might want to like st close other windows. Just in case. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. No, no. Thanks for telling me. And so with you do you have any personal experiences you could share with your and cat so if this is at any level now um within altered states of consciousness and and hopefully in specific uh through gateways uh through like the dream gateway mm -hmm. of dealing with or getting downloads i know that uh entering the desert kind of came this way yes uh from from these realms that have informed the stuff you're doing here in this plane yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very important concept. Is I always think that any kind of experience we have in a in a ritual, any kind of experience we have in a dream and an alternate state of awareness, we really want to ground it. We want to bring it back just to this uh, everyday reality, and then by doing that, we can get keys from it, tools from it. Then we have the potential for it to be some type of transformative experience. And so that's why I mentioned having meticulous magical journals, having meticulous dream journals are very, very important. You know, even I could mention just Aleister Crowley used to often quiz people, tell me what you were doing this day, two years ago in your dreams or in your magical. And then if people would say, I don't know, I don't, he's, we'll get it out, look at it. See, so most people aren't doing that. So I think we have to do that if we want to bring back these experiences into our everyday reality. We have to be that methodical in our daily practice. If we want to have some type of continuity, right? That's, that's the point. If not, then you could just have random experiences. Just like we have random experiences in life, you might meet random people that are interesting. And, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if someone wanted to seriously explore um, different things, they would have to start really making a rigorous practice of recording both their daily magical rituals, their daily dream experiences, and they'll start to see continuities 
symbols, ideas, clarity of thought, clarity of perception. And then they can start. And then what typically happens, is they start to see what you would term more synchronicity. And then they can start seeing them and use them as opportunities. Is there, uh, now I've, like I said, I, I, I'm i sure a lot of people here hopefully have read some of your work somewhere on your blog or anything. <laughs> what is the, uh, but for those that haven't, yeah. can you can you give us an idea of Gnosticism in in the paradigm that you come from now? Yeah. Because there's like, you know, there's the hardcore Gnostics. Yeah. And, you know, the Sophionic stuff and all that. So do you fill in this gap for us? That's a very good question. And I mean, because Gnosticism in general uh, is typically portrayed as this kind of dualistic perception of reality and that the soul is imprisoned in matter um, and that the spark of the divinity is caught in this prison. And then we're seeking to transcend that. Uh, my definition and my expression of Gnosticism is radically opposite of that. It's incredibly body flesh positive and that it seeks to transform the flesh, purify the flesh, transform the mind, purify the mind so that we can have experiences of the numinous of the cosmic while in the body. And as a result of those experiences, we're alchemically transformed. So I don't seek to transcend the flesh. I seek to explore the flesh, the doorways in the flesh. That's, of course, a fundamental concept in Tantra, fundamental concept in agoric practices. And these are ideas that, that we're not necessarily in a prison. Now, of course, we can talk about the idea of Maya. And that, yes, our perception often needs to be purified. The doors of perception need to be purified. So we do work to do that. But once they're purified, that's what I kind of was referring to in entering the desert about the sacramental vision, that we can hopefully purify that so that we can eventually see the world, see ourselves, see the, everything in a different light instead of seeking to escape. So hopefully that clears that up. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. So within this, within all of this and the idea of gates of perception, doors of perceptions, other realities, mm -hmm. uh, as all that's playing out is, is it possible that this is all a mod that, that this experience that we're having right now is a dream in the sense that everything is Maya, but we're collectively participating. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. There's there's a concept within that in Vedic studies, and that, that we would typically see it in the spiritual text, the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a sacred text of Vaishnavites, but it's considered sacred in all traditions. That the yo the Maya is typically a cloaking device, and it can it can confuse and cover up reality. But then through our spiritual practices, we, turn, we transform it into something called yoga maya. And yoga maya is where we're kind of like, we're able to see reality for what it is. And we can see that, oh, wow, I was living in a dream, but now I'm not. And we can see that in the Advaitic yogic perceptions. Uh, the pra, you know, Shankaracharya, he would say, all, you know, everything is a dream. Everything is really this. He wasn't saying that everything is not real. He was just saying that everything is, we're not perceiving it clearly. You know, we see a rope and we think it's a snake. But through the concept of superimposition of consciousness, we were, oh my God, that's a snake. It's going to, oh, no, it's just a rope in the dark. So that's the whole idea of yoga, that it's deconditioning our perception of reality so that we're just able to see things for how they are instead of being slaves to our senses or slaves to maya and that's our journey that's our karmic journey that's the that's the journey of the dark goddess she wants us to learn she wants us to grow she wants us to, to learn who we are and by doing that that's our lives that's our karma it's all of our experiences all of our heartache all of our sickness all of our joy is all an ex a potential experience for us to transform our consciousness to turn 
maya, which clouds our vision, into something called yoga maya, which clears. I'm wondering also within this construct, how do you have practical? I wasn't expecting to go here and my wolf is going crazy. I wasn't expecting to to kind of go down this pathway, but I, lately I'm noticing a lot of nihilistic viewpoints and sure. a darkness. And it's obvious, you know, it's obvious to see how people are getting there. Oh, and sure. do you have anything, any real practical tips for people that are experiencing these, the beginnings of a real dark path and that are running from it and maybe you have tips for people to move through the fear and anxiety, especially as we're approaching, you know, what looks like some scary stuff down the line here collectively in this realm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reason why we're always, we always try to encourage someone to have a spiritual practice and a spiritual path because our spiritual practice should start to give us the tools to allow us to navigate our realities in a grounded way. And our spiritual practices, regardless of whatever it is, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a a Thelemite, whether you're a Roshacrucian, a Martinist, a practitioner of Hinduism, a Tibetan Buddhist, I would hope that whatever practice that was, your spiritual practice was giving you tools that would allow you to not be manipulated by everyday reality, not be controlled by fear, not be con addicted to your emotional states, and was allowing you to develop some type of and I think it becomes more and more imperative the more kind of wild and unpredictable the world comes. And I think that we see this, and I touched upon this in Entering the Desert. This was a real big concept in Entering the Desert when I talked about things like uh, systems of control. And I also talked about it in Cult of about all these different ways that awareness is being manipulated by other other kind of awarenesses, but also other groups of people, is that we are able to step out of that. And we're not constantly addicted to fear or addicted to joy or constantly seeking to escape any experience. And so that's why I always encourage people to do that, is to have something that allows them to decompress. That's why, you know, spending time in nature, I mean, we like at, at the most fundamental level, you know, we know that people who spend time two to three days in nature, their cortisol levels drop. We take people out of the city and you put them in nature for a couple of days and their whole nervous system decreases. So that everything from that to what are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you eating? All these things determine our chance in life. Uh, you know, we're basically, we're in, everyone's in this world. Everyone's on their kind of walking their car, their unique karmic path. And so hopefully we have a spiritual practice of any type, which empowers us and, and gives us hope. And I think fundamentally, it gives us faith. That's a key word in Sanskrit. We call that shraddha. And we would say if, if someone doesn't have faith, then everything is going to not, and everything's going to be a faith. And Krishna, Sri Krishna talks about that in the Bhagavad Gita that, Someone has to, we have to have faith, or no matter if we don't have faith, then nothing else is going to work out. And I think I see that a lot now is people have no faith. They have no faith in themselves. They have no faith in the world. They have no faith in anything. And that's that's a dangerous. key thing you just that's said. That's very dangerous. Very dangerous. It's a, faith is one of those trigger words. And if, if we bring it back close to home and we start with the very basic idea of faith, Faith in yourself. Faith yes. that you can get up and actually walk. Absolutely. You know, just on that level and strip it from the religious stuff. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and bring it into, say, like the autonomic system. Yeah. 
and um you know it's that whole meme of save yourself first so that you can yeah. save others yeah. oh, totally. so totally. but you know just for clarity out there because i i just know i felt I, you know you can feel i can feel all of the uh the 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 non-believers in anything so i don't know the not the agnostic the uh oh right well i think that you know you bring up a, a good point there is that eventually someone's going to have to either make a choice of believing in something believing in a spiritual path or not and so that is on a fundamental level that i would always tell always tell people this if someone your, your belief doesn't determine your spiritual experience necessarily we always want to think that's the case but if someone wants to have a spiritual experience they have to try it. Like you can't be healed by a medicine by looking at the bottle. You actually have to take the medicine. That's but how you have works. to believe this is that whole experiment with yeah. That's the, how it, the yeah. sugar pill. Yeah, yeah. you have to still have to take it. Now at a higher level, <laughs> you might say if someone was an adept, they could look at the pill and say, this pill is going to heal me. But that's not your average person, right? We're, that's a sadhu in a cave in the Himalayas. Your average person living in the city doesn't have that ability. So yeah, they, yeah. They have to have a, They have to take us. They have to try a spiritual experience to have the practice. If they don't want to do that, then they need to find something which connects them to some level of a deeper experience, which grounds them and gives them some kind of faith in whatever they 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 have, whatever they feel, where they feel drawn. To. Um, and then, of course. We're back to the same question. It's maybe it's everyone has their own karma. Everyone yeah. has their own unique way of experiencing it. it. Might not be their experience to walk a certain path to do that, and that's where they are. And so I think that you know we can try to inspire people. We can try to encourage people. If someone asks for advice, I'm more than happy to talk to them. But I, I never try to proselytize. Oh yeah, it's so unattractive. Yeah, that's, that, that's just no. I have no interest. In that. Yeah, that's always turned me off. In fact, I I have the rebel gene. It'll make me go the other way real yeah, fast. Right, most people do. That's great. <laughs> but um, but in the same sense, that you know, if you and I were sitting, all three of us were sitting here talking, and and everyone in the world was the happiest they'd ever been, everyone in the world was the healthiest they'd ever been. I don't think we'd be having this conversation. But also at the same time, there wouldn't be the the whole idea of the grid of learning yeah, exactly. and in exactly. the experience that one needs to go through. I mean, I, I really do have this just deep sense of a deep sense of knowing within my core that everything I've been confronted with has been a challenge, no matter how difficult emotionally or physically or financially, wherever it's fallen, yeah, uh, has served me on a deeper greater level and sometimes and oftentimes we're blinded to that and I, and, I and totally so agree. that whole idea of faith in this particular aspect takes on a different connotation for for different people you know some, yes. yes and so but i'm here for the adversarial stuff i mean i want the grit i i want i want the interest yeah, I mean, that's a that's it's important concept to understand, and that's the you know whether we talk about it in qigong or kung fu or Chinese medicine with the yin and the yang, which were always in existence, or if we look at the Vedic, I, you know, the Vedic expressions of creation where the gods and the demons had to work together to turn the ocean consciousness for, for this dimension to exist. Is there a difference between those two things? You know, depending on where you go on the spectrum. I mean, gods, agoric, gods and demons. I mean, uh, yeah. Depending on where you go on the spectrum, uh, from an agoric perspective, perspective, um, the shadow is still a reflection of light. But your ability to perceive that is a whole other ballgame. But from the Eastern systems, they were saying no. Ever there, they we had to have that cosmic tension. We had to have that alchemical. Tension, um, for this transformation to happen. And then, of course, other dimensions might not function with that same physics, 
but here in this dimension, it, that seems to be a common idea. That's, where do you stand with the whole idea of uh, non-human entity? So aside from gods and goddesses in that sense, of these ascended type sure. entities, uh, yeah, I mean. Oh, there's infinite number of levels of reality, infinite other universes, infinite other dimensions of different types of intelligences, both incarnated in a different types of physical bodies or discarnate that are much below what we would call gods or goddesses or devas or, or devic beings. So there's a huge spectrum of that, just like we have a huge spectrum of levels of awareness in this reality. It's the same. Uh, so there's a, it's most people would be shocked uh, if they would, you know, explore the other dimensions and see just how much is out there. Um, just, just a great analogy that we were talking about before. It's like just going into a forest. There's an infinite number of species out there. Some we see, some we don't see. Some uh, clearly uh, able to identify as an animal. Other times is like a plant type being. So the universe is much the same way. Not, not and not even to mention all, like bacteria and virus. Virus, bacteria, yeah. right? All There's those exist type of intelligence. Absolutely, right. Yeah, they they are an, an intel. All of it has intelligence, and I think that that's a big hurdle for some people to get yes get past. Mm -hmm. And and especially coming from different traditions, where I mean, it's in our lifetime that the Vatican said dogs, animals have souls. <laughs> right, right. I, I yeah. wouldn't go so far as to say they're intelligent. All everything. I would say they're all everything's part of a collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More. It's probably a more accurate way to put it. So, like, there's probably a bacterium collective. Yeah. It's versus, a awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that like the mycelium, though, where it, it's still, it's like autonomic almost. Yeah. Where yeah. It, it doesn't need to be self aware. Yeah. Mycelium right. is a very uh, interesting one to discuss from that concept is, you know, where is it forming? How is it communicating? Is there non local communication? What does that mean? Um, what is their perception of reality versus ours? Plant intelligence, they're very fast. Wasn't it Paul Stamets who talked about how uh, mycelium on the earth could be our overlords, could, be, could have created humanity? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. And then how much are we, you know, being controlled by them? By them? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a huge concept. And that's yeah. a very basic concept of Tantra, Ayurvedic medicine, is that you know living with that i mean think about all the substances that we consume that evolved our consciousness even like a basic level like coffee wine tea and then we have to say well who's really controlling who in that level you know it's a fascinating idea yeah absolutely totally as i have a drink of the tea <laughs> <laughs> right on. with the caffeine thank you as i have some nicotine <laughs> exactly. Well, and it is all you know. Again, that's where that whole idea of fate and intent come in too, and where we are driving our choice. You know, the point in the end for me always seems to be how how conscious I can be in in making the choices I make, and yes. and yes. seeing seeing where those choices possibly can take me, uh, whether it's in for my betterment or not. Yeah, it's beautifully said. I think that's very important uh, for people to think of that way. Absolutely. What I mean, mar mar martial arts is the same way. It's like, are you taking martial arts to become a better person, to know yourself better, to help society, or are you taking it just to beat people up? And then so then this, it substance is the same way. It's like, why are you taking that substance? Are you taking that substance of any type because it's allowing you to have a pure expression of who you are and to experience reality, then that's, then that's wonderful. Or are you taking it just to stop you from feeling anything? That's another level. We should always ask ourselves that. What are your thoughts on, I know we're getting into two hour range, but I, I've I talked for a long time. What are your thoughts on so without, I like to stay out of politics, and I'm definitely staying out of politics, 
but I want to look at this, uh, the kind of um, viral overload that's happening sure. in, in the collective. And with the idea of viruses that we were just talking about. Sure. And, and then with a side note of possession. Mm-hmm. And how they how they enter like a Trojan horse, and that whole idea of how how they function, how they work, the functionality, right? And knowing that you're a medical practitioner, and is there are we out of balance, Craig? Well, I collectively, yeah. I mean, there's the idea that this is a bio warfare, but it's still out there. So if one's in balance, is this going to can things like that really affect us? Speaking of, are you speaking of bio biomedical vi- like created viruses? You mean? Yeah. So away from natural organic viruses, yeah, yeah. nonetheless, it's still it's still a thing. A, yeah. a bio created one is still a thing. It's a chimera of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. No, without a doubt, it has its own weird type of kind of like morphic intelligence, um, and, it, and it takes on. It's, it has its own. We could say literally to use um, a word which. Mark Stavish has written extensively on it has it has its own egregore, um, and so and I think that that does, that becomes very dangerous. We can that's where it kind of takes us into these ideas of like transhumanism and manipulated biology, and then the more we start to manipulate and do things like that, the less the natural order is going to be able to function. And then that's when things get really weird, uh, and so that's those can be very frightening things for sure depending on where they are created and what's but you you were right it's like we still on a fundamental level depending on how out of balance the physical body is the mental body the social body and the the environmental body all those things come into play which allow something to spread or something to wreak havoc in different ways and then, you know, another concept is that, you know, planets have karma. Societies have their own karma. So sometimes those things are playing out at such a larger level that we can't even conceive of. Um, and then we have to just kind of step back and experience it, depending on, you know, what's going on with that. But I think we still, to, to kind of, the best advice I can give is that is we can't live in fear. If you live in fear, then you're already, you've already lost. Every decision you make is going to be clouded by something, and you do is going to be clouded by something. So we have to have faith, and we have to live with hope. And if you lose that, then that's when a lot of real sickness will set in. And yet, there's so much social programming around yes, fear. Totally. So I, the youth are being completely indoctrinated into a fear culture without even knowing it. Completely, without a doubt. I think that's a big. We're we're, in, we're losing the idea of true individuals. Um, mm-hmm. That's a very dangerous thing, which is occurring. People, although we kind of sell it, this idea that oh yeah, you now you can be who you want to be. But, but if you look around, <laughs> I don't see a lot of unique people. No, I, I'm constantly talking about this. Yeah, I don't see a lot of radically unique people creating these radically unique things. I don't see that. Um, and that's a very, and so if everyone was doing that, if all these great cultural changes and these great drugs that people were taking was just, we were creating just like massive amounts of wonderful art, literature, music, but that's, I don't see that occurring. Um, and we're becoming more and more of a drugged culture. Uh, and then particularly drugging our youth. Yeah. Which is incredibly disturbing. Well, but it, it, that's a, it's multifaceted. So it's not just like things like, fluoride and right, you know, right, right. aluminum in the air and all that it's it's mind it's mind conditioning totally through the media and the techno god isn't that what you call it yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely and comic core yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, but i know these are important concepts that that those are fundamental ideas of both the cult of agatha and entering the desert is that our esoteric practice should start to let let us see these, to see the ways we're being manipulated, both physically and psychologically and spiritually, and to, to be able to cut those ties and, and, and to not have parasites 
just feeding off of this content. I never thought I would see the day when I would experience this co-opting of the state of a culture and where every there's a new book on witchcraft every week there's yeah. a new yeah. you know add water and stir guru around every corner yeah and uh i mean it never it's way worse than it ever ever was in in my memory and then reading back through historical stuff you know there were always booth sayers and all that yeah but right. it's like a pandemic in and of itself sure and that is a sign to me that this homogenization is not working. Yeah. Also, in one yeah, way, that's, that's, I think. Go ahead. Oh, go on. Go on. No, I was going to say that no. that's also diluting it down to nonsense. Yeah. In a, in a way. Yeah, I totally one hundred percent agree. We see it. That we're seeing a radical secularization, and then a radical um, homogenization, and then exactly what that happens is it dilutes it into just nothingness and then which is when that happens everyone's very easy to control everyone's very easy to manipulate um and that's uh, uh, those are dangerous concepts and i and i see that happening more and more that's why i speak about this i still blame iphones for it <laughs> yeah i mean that, that's definitely you know that how we're using technology is a big aspect of that that is but there's so much great technology too it's we've sure. become possessed yeah. by it yeah and that gets deepens my idea of of possession which is my thing right now yeah, yeah. um we are a society that has become possessed by our technology and i think that's a frightening path yeah uh to look at collectively because when we're talking about long cycle stuff which you know the chinese talk about the indians talk about when you look long legged into the future yeah. from the past you you can you're not thinking about this generation or that generation you're thinking in 100 years term yeah definitely i'm pretty so, sure that's what destroyed atlantis too I, it has <laughs> to there's ha, you know what jerry though these and mu and all this there seems to be a, an interesting tie-in to the parallels of what we're seeing now and these these ancient cultures. Uh, and, and, you know, they get to this point of technological excellence and don't know how to wield it in a in a way that moves the culture forward. They end up destroying themselves. Yeah, it's like a quintessential spiritual battle. Yeah, absolutely. And I've heard people even say that, oh, I don't even remember the exact wording of it, but basically the story of Atlantis is us now. Right. You know, right. The, it's an allegory of what we've become. Yeah. It's like a, like a motif that's kind of repeating in every dimension. Constantly. Yeah, exactly. Um, a template. But how easy is the path word out? Read a book get you know start yeah. the yeah. the pathway out and into into some clarity and fresh air is is actually rather simple get into nature more yeah. Yeah. breathe take take time to just be sit in a window and look out just take time to be without your device yes and and start there start writing your dreams down and and start spending time you address this in entering the desert really well uh these are practical steps that are easy for anyone in the midst of all this mind washing True. over technicized experience yeah. that, that that's eating our soul really yeah. this is a it's like we're being fed on in in a way it is it is in that sense yeah yeah there i mean there's we all our humanity in general you know, we we coexist with parasites all the time. We, but depending on what type of parasite, some parasites can cohabit with us and we can function fine. But other parasites just feed off us until we're dead. And so I think we have to kind of look at the type. You know, and so yes, we're always going to have some type of parasites around us. But then how much and what? What you know? What is that? What's going on with that? So. Well, and then some co-opt us and get what they need and and keep. Keep you a lot, you know. There are yeah. 
Yep. They're parasites that keep you alive because they want, they need you to stay alive. Yep. So they just send go. out the chemicals yep. and they get, they get what they need and they give you just enough. Totally. Yeah. So you're That's... functioning at the lowest level mm -hmm. and a... barely conscious. Look at like yeah. toxoplasmosis though, yeah. which yeah. can, you can, you can have it and it will enhance you in a way. Yeah. It's a strange alter, like almost it alters your consciousness at some other yep. strange. Yeah. Huh? It's a fascinating idea. So at this point, I guess I, I, the time, it's so crazy. Did <laughs> we have questions, Jara? I had a question early on about your books, Craig. Do you have audio versions of them? I do not have audio versions. Anathema Publishing has just the print version, okay. paperback and hardback, but no audio. Someone asked me, are you familiar with Jan Irwin? What's that? Do you know who Jan Irwin is or familiar with his work? I'm not. What, what book has he, has he written? Uh, I don't know. Okay. He's, um, what's his, I forget his channel. He used to work with um, Joe Atwood. I'm not, no, I'm not familiar okay. with him. So. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if that was a serious question or not. So, okay, no worries. Mm -hmm. Wait, so you're an Atwood Gnostic Irwin Media. Or... Gnostic Media is what he does. That's his. Oh no, I'm not familiar yeah. with that. No. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. All right. Well, um, we do another show, by the way, that is less focused. Even though we didn't, we did kind of. This was almost like novelist, but where we just let the we let the conversation go where it's going to go and try to focus less on, on the dream vehicle. So sure. it, would, it would be fun to have you back on there and just go crazy oh, I'd with, love to. with where we want to go. So, uh, wonderful. and I think Jerry and I are deciding to do that two, two times a month and then Knox Mente two times. A month. Yeah. I've already decided. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, well, it's good. And it's like new moon, full moon. Oh, that's wonderful. Think. That's a yeah. great way to do it. Yeah. So we definitely would love to have, I would love to have personally have you back on where we can just go anywhere. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I'd be honored. Absolutely. So, this has been fantastic. I thank you so much for coming on and taking us down a Vedic pathway uh, that is very uncommon. I don't, we really haven't had many people that have this depth of knowledge and these pathways yeah, on right. this sh particular show, right, Jar? No, not that I can remember. Yeah, not at this level. So it's been, uh, I know it's been kind of mind-blowing for a lot of our listeners, which is what we want to give. Excellent. <laughs> New I'm, things to chew on. I'm honored to be on, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to read my work. That means a lot, and it allows us to really have a unique discussion. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, read more books. And I can't, like, to, I don't push books. I do not push much on anyone at all. But, and I'm not pushing your books towards anyone, but I'm saying if you're looking for something amazing to read, I was deeply, and at any, you can go in at any level, wherever you are in your life, and get something deep out of Craig's work. It's amazing. As, entering the desert, I can't recommend enough. It's a framework. It gives you wherever you are and what your praxis is. It doesn't matter. It's actually just, a, it, it ends up being like a framework to work within where you bring your special something into it. No, I appreciate that. And I wrote Entering the Desert and Cult, and Cult of Gagatha to work together and they kind of cross, go back and forth and you can find little secret doorways back and forth between the two books. Yeah, that's, well, that's, that's I, of course, that's, that's how I did it. I, and, and then, <laughs> you know, happening. pathways into Bertios. I say Bertios. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and all of this other stuff that I'm so familiar with. And then, you know, it just unlocked new neural pathways for me and great ways. The way that reading Jung does. So oh, that's just, wonderful. That's exactly what I was hoping for with Golgotha and Desert. So that's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's a gift to the left. Thank you, Craig. Did, and did you I have, have any, nothing. Did you have anything Very you wanted to plug, Craig? No, I mean, I think, I, you know, I would encourage people to check out um, Anathema Publishing, who, and then, uh, you know, Cult of Agatha is out, and then Entering the Desert as well. They can find both those in Anathema Publishing, and 
we will publish um, Tantric Physics 2, Sacred Body, Sacred Space in 2020. And there will also be a reissue of the sold out Tantric Physics Volume 1, Cave of the Numinous. Those will be put together into one. So I'm really excited about that. And that'll be out in 2020. But lots of exciting things coming up. And I'm constantly writing blogs for uh, my transmissions from the Kali Yuga blog or my Ayurveda medical blog. And those are, that'll be a constant. There's not enough time to write everything, so I'll write it hard. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. We're off. Like, how do I structure more time? Yeah. So, again, a, to, to deepening of the conversation next time, and uh, and nice to officially meet you. Yes, absolutely. It's Thank you. On. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Nish. And I don't know who our guest is next week because I haven't booked one, so it'll be a surprise. <laughs> 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 so everyone have a great night and we'll see you next week take care take care thank you everyone